Let me uh, start by sharing a, a screen here. I want to show the, the folks. So uh, I want to give some context around uh, how presidential candidates of the Libertarian Party have fared since the party's inception in 1972. And uh, as you can see, these have been our candidates uh, every presidential cycle since 1972. And... Um, you can see we start out with John Hospers, Roger McBride, Ed Clark, David Berglund, Ron Paul, of course, Andre Maru, Harry Brown twice, Michael Bednarik, Bob Barr, Gary Johnson twice, and last cycle, Joe Jorgensen. And of course, this year, uh, our, candid uh, our presidential ticket for the LP is Chase Oliver and Mike Termott. Um, now, of course, we can take a look at this and see that... The population, uh, uh, the popular votes we've uh, the party has been getting has been steadily increasing uh, the last uh, four cycles, I would say. Now, there is this outlier in 1980 where we had almost a million votes for Ed Clark, but I think that could largely be attributed to uh, David Cook being uh, on the ticket and, of course, having that Cook money to spend on his own campaign. So what's interesting here for context is Gary Johnson was the first libertarian presidential candidate uh, to get over a million popular votes, almost 1% of, of the popular vote. Uh, in 2016, he managed to get the highest total ever in terms of just raw count, for, uh, almost 4.5 million votes, and over 3% uh, of the popular vote. Uh, Joe Jorgensen last year with Spike Cohen on the ticket, nearly 2 million votes. Yes, a drop-off, uh, but still... Uh, a respectable total and coming in at over 1%. Now, the reason I put those numbers up is that while I think those are respectable numbers for, for, for the party, um, there are those, and again, I mentioned uh, Martha and Kate from last week's episode who are saying, hey, look, maybe it's time we admit that the Libertarian Party, in terms of a party, it's futile to try to win and influence policy uh, through elections that, hey, we have to either start doing um, uh, free state projects or we have to start affecting more local uh, elections, work in your neighborhood, which we all agree is important. But let me just toss this out there. Uh, let's start with Star Child, because I know last week you had some comments for the ladies. Um, do you feel that, that the LP is a lost cause in terms of being a viable political entity in the U.S. right now? No, no, absolutely not. I, I think that people, um, a lot of people have an insecurity around it. They, they feel a need to be seen as winners, you know, and, and, and I think Trump has just exacerbated this with his habit of uh, using the term loser as an insult, calling people losers. Right. You know, it has to be about winning and winning in conventional terms. Well, you know, we're not about winning in conventional terms, as I see it. We're, we're about winning in libertarian terms, advancing the cause of freedom. And, you know, while the, the Libertarian Party in the United States has been struggling along, as you say, with these relatively small percentages of the vote and popular vote totals, the movement, I feel like, has been growing by leaps and bounds, not just here, but worldwide. And this really should be, and I think increasingly is and will be, a worldwide conversation about freedom and we have the world's first libertarian elected head of state now in argentina uh, which is super exciting and he's one of the highest profile leaders of any country in the world uh at this point i think it's fair to say right. um partly because of his own eccentricity but to a good extent because people recognize i think that he he is an ideologue and i mean that in the best sense of the term he's somebody that believes in ideas and they're decent ideas he's not you know some some horrible racist or somebody trying to you know turn back the clock or or you know right. these kinds of things he's um but he's someone who believes in ideas and takes that seriously and and people can see that i think because he doesn't do all the same things that a conventional politician who's just so worried about you know staying in power or or uh you know uh 
getting along with people and, and making nice with the other establishment of people and so forth would do. Right. Uh, and so I think that's refreshing. And, and I, I think it's just a symptom of, of where we are right now in the global zeitgeist that more and more people are going to be waking up to these ideas. Yeah. And, and, and the Libertarian that, Party. That be... very much part of right. Uh, Sorry, Charles, ahead. obviously, um, Star Child is making the point that even if we don't win elections, we're shaping and influence people's ideas about liberty and furthering acceptance of liberty. Now, as a, obviously, you must have believed in the viability of the Libertarian Party as a political entity, uh, considering you actually went through. And, and listen, it's not a cakewalk. It's arduous. It's expensive. It's it's it, you know it takes a lot of effort and commitment. You, you know when you ran to try to get the nomination for president, like. You know, I see it. I, I, I would, I would, I would echo what Starchild said. I mean, I think, I think having a, another voice to, to for these, for, for persons to hear that there's an alternative solution to, 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 you know, to the usual political class is imperative in this country right now. We have basically, you know, a two-party system where people, you know, function as sheep. Listening, you have a coronation of a Democratic nominee right now without, without, you know, electoral, you know, process being taken place. You have a, another person on the opposite side that has hijacked a party a third voice is is necessary i mean we we i mean this country this world deserves another voice to try to you know bring some reason into what is being a sort of a tyranny of, of a huge government that that continues to control our lives you know to this day and, and it continues to i mean i think this party holds tremendous promise not simply because it's vogue to change one's political ideas every so often I think, you know, as there is tremendous government overreach, people are going to recognize that less government is better and that we are being controlled by entities that don't have much care for the everyday citizen. I mean, so I, I think we have an obligation to continue doing what we're doing. And and I tend to agree with you, um, but I do sense that, that sense of... Uh, exasperation of people like saying hey Absolutely we've put some I mean, these, these two other parties have been in, been in power for for long much longer than the libertarian party i mean if you right. just show that graph again you see that, that this we are we are trending upwards as opposed to trending downwards i mean you know th this the fact that one loses an election i mean yes i do believe one needs to start at, at a lower threshold you need to start from local communities and state races and you know and, and you work your way up you're not going to win the presidency that's that's absurd um to think that it's going to happen right away but at least we can change dialogue for the better and 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 open eye uh, people's you know minds there perhaps we can throw a few ideas out there that some of the the current persons in power will accept and may and you know if we speak loud enough perhaps Perhaps the public will get behind some of these ideas and we can change things for uh, in a manner that would actually suit, you know, suit our country in libertarian ways. Yeah. And, and you know, I'm maybe I'm an idiot, but I'm still optimistic about the country and I'm optimistic about our political system to right. the extent that now, listen, there's a natural uh, uh, antagonism here because libertarians are individualists by definition. Uh, so by having uh, asking libertarians to participate in a political system, it seems to be contradict. Uh, it contradicts their nature. You know, you can't judge an electrician by his ability to be a plumber, right? Uh, so, so we're asking a bunch of really determined individuals to say, "Let's play collectivist uh, here. Let's play collectivism to achieve individualist goals." And and that on its face can cause a lot of tension and cause right. a lot of uh, contradiction. Uh, but to the extent that, uh, again, as we start to look at libertarians and, and infighting, not in the sense of who I like and who I dislike, but in the sense that if you're an anarchist, you believe in no government, like properly defined, you believe in no government. So the only reason for an anarchist to participate in the political system is for nonviolent uh, elimination of the government. Whereas if you're a more any other flavor of libertarianist, whether it's a minic, minarchist, constitutionalist, classical liberal, uh, you know, you're at least advocating for the existence of a government and to minimize it in our lives. So um, to that extent, the way the Libertarian Party is right now as a political entity, Starchild, do you feel it's built uh, policy-wise directionally? To serve that end of minimal government, or is it 
again, is it more of a um, let's tear it all down because all government is bad, irrespective of the goal? Well, for those who may not be as versed with the Libertarian Party and its history, going back to 1974, you know, uh, there was an agreement that was informally come up with at the party's Dallas convention that year called the Dallas Accord, which basically people, because people were even then fighting about anarchism versus minarchism or limited government. And there was kind of a, a broad consensus reached, as, as I understand it. I wasn't obviously around mm -hmm. at that time, but um, the... Uh, uh, consensus was that the party wouldn't take a final stance on what the ultimate end goal was, whether it was mm -hmm. anarchy or limited government. But we just we'd keep going in that direction. As some people have used the analogy with the the Nolan chart, you know, the diamond shaped chart where you have left, right politically, and then you have mm -hmm. libertarian, authoritarian. They said, well, we'll just keep. We're like a train. We're going north on the Nolan chart. You know, you get off at your stop. You know, when you think things are too free, that we have too much freedom. Then, then that's the time where you quit the party and stop working for more liberty, you know. Right. And then, right. So, and uh, you mentioned individualism earlier. I don't know if you want to get into that whole can of worms, but I, I had some thoughts on that. If you're curious, yeah, to. I would love to get into it. That's why we're here. We're here to have a conversation. Okay. But before you get into that, let me ask yeah. Charles: like, is what yeah, sure. like what I gathered from from Star Child's answer? Sort of like there's virtue, there's 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 honor in just the battle itself. That it, that the very act of saying we are fighting for a more free society, that That's in good. itself is the end goal, as opposed to we've achieved X number of occupants of the White House. That's true, but I mean, what I hear in Star Challenge is this is more of an inclusion party as opposed to an mm -hmm. exclusion party. I mean, so you know, my stance on this is I I. I I don't want to be controlled by, a, you know, a large government. And I think persons make their own choices. Let me make my own bad choices is sort of like what's everyone sort of been preaching for the longest of times. Um, I think this party holds tremendous promise because as the government overreach continues and people begin to see that a two party system um, is is not in their best interest, that persons may come to grips and say where I find a problem right now with the Libertarian Party is does not it's not in any of its people. It's it's the act of not realizing that we need to get into office and and perhaps incrementalism may be a more pragmatic way to go about doing something so that you don't scare off persons that are not um you know where i have a problem is when people say you're not enough of a libertarian it's like going into church and saying you're not you're not religious enough while at the same time you're standing here in church and you are participating so you should be included i'm more of a kind of like if you're willing to listen and you're willing to try to help try to lessen government by all means let's let's let you in and, and let's like you know try to get this going because you may your 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 old mind your your opinions may shift over time and you may right. you know you you may you may shift even more libertarian than i would ever be um but 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 let you on this bandwagon let you into our tent so that you can begin to see that there's an alternative means other than just voting the two-party system red or blue yeah and and to be honest with you it, it's always dumbfounding to dumb it's mind baffling to me libertarians are always focused on the small percentage we disagree on as opposed right. to the overwhelming majority that we could all Everything agree to that's yeah right. and and right. and that's always been a fatal flaw for this party and just politically because i think philosophically very few of us would actually get up in arms you know like i could right. sit down with you know, a Maury Roth, a Rothbard, or uh, or uh, you know, uh, you know, Milton Friedman, if he were alive, and I, I would find common ground, Austrian or Chicago school, whatever. You know, like there's so much that is valid and virtuous in both. You know, in all parts of what you know we describe as libertarianism, as as a uh, little l libertarianism. Right. So I think that 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 makes sense. I'm sorry. Yes, sorry, child. Go ahead. Yeah, maybe sometimes I think I'm just too much for con contrarian and that's something else that people say about okay. libertarians but absolutely i i i, I want to push back on, on that a little bit i think that um people well uh oh, i was going to talk about individualism too shoot um the <laughs> losing my train of thought um let me go to the individualism thing first so i think that um libertarianism to me is properly based on the non-aggression principle and that that's not I think inherently individualist. It, it's only individualist insofar as we experience aggression on the individual level. And so that's kind of where rights come into play. Right. 
uh, if if you know somehow there were uh, some collectivist entity that was capable of being sentient or feeling suffering or pain or these kinds of things, or some sub individual. A uh, group of cells or something in our, our body that achieves some some ability to be aware or communicate or whatever, you know, it wouldn't be. I don't think that would destroy libertarianism, but it would mean we'd have to change our definition of rights away from the individualist aspect. And the other thing about individualism is that, you know, you can be an individualist in terms of politics and, and believing that you know people have individual rights and all this, but it doesn't necessarily mean that you go about your life as an individualist person, you can be a very social group oriented person yes. and be a good libertarian in terms of practicing non-aggression. And, uh, you know, you don't have to live your life as, as, you know, an individualist of, of any stripe, let alone the sort of, you know, stereotypical rugged individualist, you know, <laughs> shotgun right. get off my property kind of guy. <laughs> yeah, uh, I agree. And, and, you know, so Charles, maybe, I think a lot of, of say, go ahead, star child. I'm sorry. Go, go ahead. ahead. No, I was going to say, yeah, you know, that's oh, one yeah, of those. No, mis I, I had another thought that I was something you said I was going to respond to, and I, I completely forgot it. So go. Okay, if it on. comes to you, if it comes to you, Star Child, you let you let me know. But I was going to say, like one of one of these stereotypes that you're always battling against in your everyday interactions, Charles, is oh, you're a libertarian. That means you're 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 self you're selfish. You're self centered. You look out for number one. Uh, you don't give a rat's behind about anybody who's suffering in the world. What about the poor? What about the elderly? What about the disabled? What about those who, who, who just don't have, right? Yeah, I was going to say, talk to me about that because yeah, it kind of builds on what I mean, Starchild I mean, I, said. Yeah, I, I, I mean, you know, it's, it's not to throw what I do as an occupation in, but I mean, I, I get up every day and try to take care of the people, American people. And, and, and I, I would venture to say that compared to most individuals in this country in occupations, I try to do more on any given day to help those. I just see a system that, that is broken because I mean, if you leave it to a large government to, you know, it's sort of like a shirt. If, if you're going to use a one size fits all for everyone, it doesn't fit everyone and not everyone fits into the shirt and it doesn't work. And it, you know, and so in government sort of like that, you know I mean? It, it sounds really nice. If you're, if you're in that ideal spot that, you know, the, and, and that spot is what exactly what this country needs, you may get what it is that you need, choose, want, etc. But if you don't fall within the confines of this very limited uh, decision that someone is making from from another point of view, then you're maybe SOL. And, and so, you know, from a libertarian perspective, I think that that I, I just believe that persons can make their own better decisions. Local communities can make their better decisions. States can make their better decisions. And when the founding fathers came forth, you know, coming, you know, coming, coming to grips and making this republic, they realized that the federal government was necessary to unify and to protect, but it was not something that should be controlling. You know, it's not this omnipotent right. being that should control all of our lives. And they were smart like this. And but but somehow we have we have shifted to a socialistic society where where we depend upon the federal government to take care of our needs to a degree that the founding fathers would have probably found abhorrent. Yeah, I, and and you know it's one of those things that I think it's almost like you know unfortunately not to I, and really I'm not a violent guy. People people see me in person and they're like, oh, you're this big lumbering guy. You must you must love fighting people and getting into. I hate violence. I I I never resort to it unless I'm absolutely forced to. But you know, uh, you know Jefferson was right. Once a generation, it almost seems like we need to be reminded of how precious liberty is. Right, That's so. Right. One of my, you know, uh, stories I like to relate uh, for people who've been watching every episode that they've, they've heard this two or three times from me. But I, I was born in the U.S., but I'm the I'm the son of immigrant parents. Both both my mother and father uh, immig uh, emigrated to this country, and they escaped fascism to come here. Uh, they escaped communism to come here. So I was raised with stories of. Don't ever, don't ever grow up to be a communist, son. Why, right. Dad? Because they're the only ones who have the guns, and they decide who gets to have dinner on every single day. And guess what? They're always at the front of the line to feed themselves, you know. And you know, you kept hearing stories of these atrocities and, and this type of living under, you know, occupation type of things. And so I grew up with an appreciation of man, the fact that I could just walk out of my home. Uh, go to my local store uh, exchange and free trade with my local grocer, get what I need. He gets what he needs from me and we're all happy. Um, 
I think most Americans have no concept of how precious that is and how, how there are still parts of this world where that's not the case, uh, where, you know, we look at England, you, you dare criticize the government. You dare express a non-sanctioned opinion. You are now facing jail time. That's right. In, in, in England, right? Uh, a country not too far from our, our Western uh, law tradition, our common law tradition. So it is something that could be easily lost. And I do think Jefferson was right. Now, whether that requires armed revolution, violence in order to retain that, I'm hoping it doesn't. But, you know, uh, it, who knows? It, it, it might uh, at some point. Okay. So now, in terms of. <laughs> go ahead, Star Child. Yeah, so um, you were talking about the tendency among a lot of libertarians to, uh, you know, argue with each other over yes. uh, small differences among people that uh, are mostly in agreement. Right. And I think that in some ways actually speaks well of us. And here's why. It's okay. because we care about ideas enough. We know that ideas matter. Right. You know, if, if you're just a careerist or an opportunist or whatever, it's good enough just to, to, you know, have an alignment of self-interest with the people that you need to work with. That's all right. you really need. You're not concerned about building the ideal society or what that might look like or the steps necessary to get there. You know, you're just trying to win the next election or get that, that you know, juicy paycheck or whatever it is. Um, and, and so we have sort of a higher standard. We, we see the importance of ideas. We want to communicate these things. We're, we're seekers of truth. And um, so I think that's where a lot of it comes from. We just we need to learn to be nicer to people when we're, we're having these conversations. And, you know, as, as Thomas Jefferson said, you know, never let the disagreement get in the way of a, a friendship or uh, words to that effect. Yeah. So no, and that's a great point. So um, how do you gentlemen feel about perhaps? Well, before I ask this, one of the other um always stumbling blocks for the libertarian party is the fact that we're not allowed to compete on equal ground with the other political parties with the, with the so-called duopoly, the Republicans and Democrats in this country. Ballot access is always going to be an issue for us. Uh, in my, and I looked up an example, my home state here in New York, uh, where, you know, I was at a fundraiser last night with Chase Oliver, uh, great to meet our presidential, uh, uh, candidate, and our, our nominee for the uh, party thing, great man, uh, met him in New York City, the heart of left-wing uh, liberalism, however you want to describe uh, New York City these days, uh, lawlessness, whatever. Um, and he can, no, in New York, you cannot pull the lever for uh, Chase Oliver or Jill Stein or RFK. And just so the folks out there know, like I know we've had our friend Larry Sharp here several episodes episode several times to explain this to us but here's an example i want you two guys to listen to this um in 2020 the state legislature increased the threshold for independent parties to maintain ballot access from 50,000 votes to 130,000 votes or two percent of the total turnout whichever is highest this change made it even more difficult for my minor parties to maintain their ballot access even after spending time and effort and resources uh, to, to obtain ballot access. And they did this specifically, uh, to get libertarian, the libertarian party off the ballot in New York state for the specific, for this year's elect presidential election cycle, independent presidential candidates need to collect 45,000 signatures. Those signatures have to number at least 500 from half of the state's 26 congressional districts. So for example, uh, you can't just say, well, we're going to upstate New York, which tends to be a little bit more free, a little bit more open, and we'll get our requirements there. No, you also have to go into the heart of liberalism in the five boroughs of New York City uh, and get a minimum number of votes. Um, and the petition period is only six weeks long. So uh, that's another thing. It's not like you could spend a year building up to this high number. You only have a six-week period to do it. And of course, on top of that, every step along the way, you're facing legal challenges. Now, he's not a libertarian by a stretch of the imagination, despite what the LNC says. But RFK was just disqualified on a legal challenge because the address he used on his paperwork, and there's always a multitude of paperwork, uh, they challenged whether or not he was an actual resident of the New York address he used. And it turns out that a judge ruled he wasn't. And for the record, I looked it up. 
the judge was in fact a Democrat, and the uh, the suit was brought forth by a uh, basically a front for the Democratic Party of New York. So, and similar things are happening, like in Illinois. So, the Libertarian Party it's this year is all the time. Both establishment parties, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's yeah, it's, it's dirty real. tricks. Yeah. It's dirty tricks. So, given that, what is what is a solution for us? So, I'm asking you guys. You guys, more so than I'll ever be. Uh, are actually uh, have participated in the political process, the down and dirty, as it were, right. um, on both the local and the national level. How do we how do we claw our way out of this, if at all? Like, how do we ensure that at least people can hear about libertarian candidates? How, like, so Chase, can we get a couple of votes for him in New York and Illinois? Uh, every year, it seems like we have spent longer and longer periods of time to just maintain our ballot access. Um, should that be a goal of the Libertarian Party? Because it is so time consuming. It is so expensive. Are we better off just pushing forth our ideas? Again, the first party to endorse uh, gay marriage, the Libertarian Party, the first party uh, to, to call for the legalization of drugs, uh, specifically marijuana, the Libertarian Party, uh, always champions of free speech, the Libertarian Party, first and foremost. Is that what we're better off doing? Are we better off putting uh, those ideological seeds in the soil and then see them come come to fruition 20 years later, 25 years later, as we have seen since 1972? A lot of our original positions were finally adopted by society at large. I don't know. Charles, what do you think? I think you, you need to do both. I mean, I, I think you don't give up. I mean, all of these things that you are referring to are accomplishments, and they're accomplishments courtesy of this party. Uh, I, I, I would bet, I, I would proffer to you that that as the Libertarian Party continues to achieve greater success, those um, the ballot access laws are going to become more and more stringent to keep you off. I mean, this is a game that's being played, and, and it's and it's it's not unfortunate; it's horrible. Um, but it, but I think the way you combat that is that you need to be able to realize that you don't hold someone um, at at arm's length because they are not as libertarian as yourself. We need to right. we need to bring people into this party that are willing to work at ballot access that actually have money and funds that want to affect change and want to see people in office. And again, I would agree you have to start small and work your way up to prove your you know to prove that that the ideas that 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 he or she has actually works and, and that can that can make society better. You're not going to start off at the top and work your way down. It's going to be work your way up improve yourself but i think the way to do this is you run a very very and it, and it, it it's it, it's counter to what libertarians think um, as individual persons there has to be some means by which that you can corral all of these persons these individual minded persons together and so listen we, the, this is the this is the north store that we're shooting for but but in order to achieve this goal we all have to collectively come together and support our candidates they chase or we all have to support you know this person down in El Paso or this person down in Florida, et cetera. So that, uh, and that, and that is not, not singularly on social media, et cetera. This is financially, this is, you know, go across the board, but we don't do that by, by, by destroying persons in the own party simply because they are not aligned with as libertarian as, as one you know, perceives themselves to be. Um, I, mean, I think I, I, I'm a kind of a, I, I, don't, I, I accept anybody as, you know, as long as you're, you're not going to hurt me and you're not going to thrust your values upon me, I will, I will embrace you and be friends with you, et cetera. And that's what this party should actually try to, I think, try to achieve because I think, I think this party holds great promise I, I, this year. Obviously it's going to be tough. Um, you have RFK in this whole race, but I still think there's a tremendous value in this party running and trying to field a candidate. Our child, uh, I saw you at the national convention. I saw you uh, protesting as as uh, you should. Uh, there was an incident you got roughed up. Um, I don't know if you want to talk about it at all, but do you feel that the Libertarian Party? If you is, want to talk is, about it, we can. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's up to you. Uh, but 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 I want to also phrase it in the context of: um, Do you feel the party is accomplishing, or is is still trying to accomplish what what Charles just described, which is be accepting? Uh, move forward, try to get victories wherever you can, while at the same time espousing libertarian ideas, liberty ideals. Um, do you feel we're still on that path as a political party? 
I think we are. Uh, I think Chase's nomination uh, in part shows that, you know, I think that, um, and I, I agree with probably 90% of what Charles just said. Uh, definitely it's both the uh, talking about the ideas and pursuing office, but even though I've run for office six times myself, I'm not a big believer that, oh, this is the be all end all of the party. In fact, what I think, and I don't hear people talking about this, which seems a little bit strange to me because to me it's, it's, you know, it seems so clear that the, the possibly the, the biggest value in my mind that the libertarian party has, it's not even that it's a, a political party per se. It's a, that it's the genesis of a mass movement because I think I could be wrong about this, but in terms of sheer numbers, I think it's probably the largest small L libertarian organization in the world. And by that, I mean, it has the largest number of people who are self-consciously identified as libertarians or working broadly for freedom and the non-aggression principle. Right. And what we do with that organization, you know, the, the government wants to put organizations into these different categories. Say, oh, you're ty this type of organization. So you have to be doing X, Y, and Z in our case, you know, trying to win elections. And a number of libertarians, strangely to me, seem to have bought into this idea that like, well, we have to define ourselves according to, you know, this artificial category of political parties that's been established in the governmental system. And I think we should be trying to advance uh, liberty by any ethical means uh, necessary. Anything that looks like, like a tactic, it's a good uh, way to move forward as long as it doesn't go against our ideas and we should be trying to think outside the box I sometimes use the Black Panther Party as uh, an illustration of this because although they call themselves a political party They were doing a lot of other things, you know, they were right. they were cop watching, you know They were monitoring the police trying to keep them from abusing people. They were doing community soup kitchens, you know, they were doing a lot of other things that people don't think of in terms of a political party and um, look around when regimes fall and you know real authority i'm not talking about it to transfer power in this country but the serious bad ones you know it's usually either some kind of palace coup in which case usually not too much changes because like some element of the same old guard that was in there right like this happened in zimbabwe recently you know the mugabe's out but now manon dagwa or however you say his name is in um and uh the second method is there's some kind of bl bloody revolution which is really rolling the dice you don't know how that's going to turn out and a lot of people often suffer and lose their lives the third way which is really the you know the way we want to be aiming for is the mass people power way where basically so many people get out and occupy prominent public places they get out in the streets and they won't sit down or shut up or go home until the regime falls and, and this has worked again and again, you know, in the Philippines, the People Power Revolution, the Orange Revolution in Ukraine. Um, you know, we've seen it happen different places over and over in Bangladesh. It just happened. You know, the president was forced to flee the country, basically, because the people wouldn't sit down, shut up and go home. Right. And so I think our goal or one of our main goals, if not the main goal as a libertarian organization, should be to build that kind of capacity for people power to get people out in the streets and political parties are one of three types of groups that historically and in the world today uh currently i think are generally at the forefront of this kind of people power movement and those are political parties uh student organizations and organized labor those are kind of the big three that usually have the capacity to build these sort of mass movements of resistance so for that reason i think you know the libertarian party is invaluable as this this network and we should be trying to focus more on building that and you know yeah sure let's run for office i absolutely think having a presidential candidate is, is a great focal point it gets people energized you know it uh, it gives visibility and all this kind of thing even if we only get one percent you know but that's that's not the point the point is to to build the movement and to generate this capacity for resistance i think well that's interesting because a lot of those three uh things that you mentioned uh student organizations uh, unions what was the third one for people power it was student unions or and political parties. parties. Well, the pro I, I think the problem with the uh, Charles, if I'm hearing Star Child correct, the problem with the unions and the school organizations is those are steeply indoctrinated in a very specific ideology. And um, 
to to break free of that is also an effort not just on us for convincing folks like say students to come out like yes ron paul the ron paul revolution uh which to someone of my generation me meant nothing if i'm being honest it was not ron paul who got me into libertarianism right I, i'm not i don't have anything against ron paul he's just not my impetus for for becoming a libertarian um, but it was for a lot of people of a certain generation. But even so, it wasn't like the equivalent of, say, uh, the the effect JFK had with Camelot or the Clinton, uh, the um, uh, Bill Clinton's uh, getting or Barack Obama. Right? It's just a matter of scale at that point. So, Charles, is it more an opportunity of having to deal? W- like, do you feel it's literally a case of trying to persuade and influence people? that we run across in our daily lives as individuals, like, Hey, you know, like I, 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 I tell this too all the time. My first job, job number one was trying to convince my niece of the virtues of libertarianism from the time she was a 10 year old, you know? And interestingly enough, young kids get it a lot more than adults, you know, like why taxation is bad, why, you know, uh, uh oppressive, oppressing speech is bad. And, and all that thing, like kids tend to get it until we educate it out of them. Right. So, so is that a better approach that as individuals, like, like I do this all the time, I strive to live, even though I'm not an anarchist, I strive to live an anarchist life, uh, in my everyday life. Right. I, I keep to myself. If, if I can help someone in need, I do, uh, you know, I engage in free trade, I, you know, blah, 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 extend. Is that the better way? Or do you feel it's organizationally? I mean, I understand we run our candidates, we run for office. But just as a change agent, how can how can we get libertarian is in there through some specific change agent? Would you say? I mean, I agree with Star Child. And the fact, yes, you can affect change. I mean, you have to create a movement to do so. But ultimately, I mean, when it comes down to it, um, you know, you are trying to affect change that's going to affect you know your family, your society, etc. And the only way you're going to do it is you're controlling the the laws because currently, you know, we're we're governed by far too many laws. I mean, so. You know, so I do think that 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 politics should be a, a a you know a something that this this party should strive to try to do well at, so that we can affect change in a manner that we are trying to achieve liberty. I agree. I mean, look, I, I completely get where you're coming from, Star Child, and that yes, you can do a lot of good without running anyone for office and and creating change, and persons will listen, etc. But when it comes down to it, you know, the organizational unions, etc. Are generally, you know, they're focused on getting their candidate in so they can achieve, you know, the laws and the rules and and, and the uh, and the you know and the pork, so to speak, you know, consequent to the persons that they put into office, and that that holds true for any political organization, so to speak. But in this particular organization, it's it's no pork. We want to try to make it lean and 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 try to make things better or at least what we would conceive to be as a better solution and let people make their own ideas and save their own money and spend their own money on things that they deem appropriate and raise their children and educate their children and do things that that, when you when you get into a a revolutionary type situation though charles or a situation where there's real potential for change I don't, I don't think that, you know, the groups you mentioned, like the labor groups are necessarily just focused on sort of their bread and butter issues. I mean, when, when regimes fall, and, and this is even more true, I think of student groups, that, that they tend to be more idealistic. Well, they are. And, 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 and not and have and sort of self-interested demands. Right. And no, and, and I agree, but there's discord. There's, that, they're, not, they're not creating this. They're not affecting change because they're, they're happy with the current environment. You know, they, they are creating change because of because of what they see as 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 problem. Um, and um, and that's, you know, in, in, in order to achieve the results that I think that you're referring to in order uh, in order to do so in a in a in a, in a manner that is nonviolent and um, in and is the you know, is, is I guess the way we would see change as being affected in, in a much more a much more um, altruistic fashion would be. To have an organization that runs candidates and 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 legally and nonviolently gets people to affect change in a positive way. Yeah. Well, again, I, I I'm not against that. I mean, like I said, I've I've run for public office half a dozen times here. You know, at the local level, as you were saying, right. from the bottom up. You know, I haven't run for right. anything higher than state assembly, but. Um, 
I, I think that uh, we can walk and chew gum at the same time. Absolutely. You know? Absolutely. Um, I agree we, with you. We heart. don't. 100%. So, so I, I think that, the, the, you know, again, being tactically flexible, strategically principled, but tactically flexible, you know, any, anything ethical that advances the cause of, of freedom, you know, let's do that. I mean, you can go out and, and do art and get involved in student or labor organizing or whatever, and run for right. office. Um, but part of the problem we've had, I think, with the movement and the party, <clears throat> and it's gotten worse in recent years in the party, with the whole Mises caucus situation, I think, is that we've tended to appeal more to people on the right than to people on the left in terms of right. our messaging and the issues that we focus on. <clears throat> and the problem with this in a in a two-party system, you know, where the country is so polarized between left and right, and to some extent this is true in the rest of the world, but it's particularly true in this country right now, um, that uh, we could easily become marginalized the way both uh, the the movements that I think had real potential to be grassroots popular movements in recent years, Occupy and the Tea Party, they both got marginalized. The Tea Party got marginalized on the right, and Occupy got marginalized on the left. Um, that hasn't happened yet to the Libertarian Party and the Libertarian movement, and I pray that it doesn't, because I think our survival as a sustainably libertarian movement, an effective libertarian political party. Um, to appeal to people on both sides. And when you start to appeal too much to people on one side or the other, it can become a self-reinforcing trend because you bring in people that, you know, usually they're not fully libertarian when they join the party or the movement and get involved. It's a, it's a gradual process of education. It took me many years to identify as an anarchist and, uh, you know, shed some of my status baggage as I see it anyway. And yeah, that's true for a lot of people. Um, and so, you know, if you bring in a bunch of people that have this, uh, you know, still residual beliefs or things associated with one half or the other political spectrum, it can be like a ship taking on water to starboard. You know, you take on right. some water, it causes you to tilt that direction a little more, which causes you to take on even more water until you sink. So okay. I don't want to see that happen to us. I want to see us, you know, appeal as much to people on the left as people on the right. And also the, the other two groups besides the parties, the labor organizations and the student organizations, as as either one of you said, you know, they're they're both basically dominated by the left, you know, leftist ideology. And so if we want to make inroads there, we need to be much better at outreach to the left, uh, uh, showing them that libertarian ideas aren't just, you know, they don't just work better. They're, they're more compassionate. You know, they're more idealistic in terms of the ideals that, that the left, the best part of the left believes in at achieving those ideals than, than the statist establishment. You know, I love to use the argument here in San Francisco. There's like thousands of people on the street in the city homeless. You know, it's become a national embarrassment, actually, to the, the local Democratic leadership here because the, the right wing likes to make hay with it. But, you know, it's true. And, that, and there's meanwhile thousands of people in city government you know, huge pop portion of the population. It's not as bad as anywhere near Argentina levels, but still a really significant portion of the people work for government and they're making six figure salaries. And the homeless people, the poor people, you know, their taxes, every time they go to the store and buy something, you know, part of that sales tax is going to pay these people at city hall making these six figure salaries. It, it's a moral outrage. And, you know, if we could more effectively and clearly communicate that message as libertarians, the idealistic people, the people that are really sort of the, the influencers on the left, um, you know, those people would start informing their political ideas when they're young to become libertarian by default instead of leftist by default. Right. And, and, and you know, it's, it's a little bit of a struggle because left's ideas... I'm sorry, go ahead. I'm, I'm rambling. Oh, no, no, that's okay. Start all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know. And I know there's a little bit of a delay, so I understand that. But what I was going to say is you said something interesting. Uh, as long as uh, the, the tactics are ethical, you know, and, and, you know, there's an elephant in the room. I'm going to bring it up. Whoever feels like they don't want to answer, uh, don't answer, but I'll throw it out there anyway. Um, look, uh, prior to the Reno reset, there was always those allegations that the Sarwark led LNC was too too much leaning left now i hate the concept of left right paradigms when it applies to the libertarian party i think we should fit in neither i think we should define ourselves as either pro-liberty or or decry anti-liberty mm -hmm. but 
uh, to the common parlance, the feeling was pre Reno reset, the Libertarian Party was much more favorable to to left leaning libertarians as opposed to right leaning libertarians. Since the Reno takeover, the the argument's been reversed. Right now, we're saying, hey, we seem to be more welcoming of like a national. I heard Vivek say, "I want libertarian nationalism," which is an oxymoron, in my opinion. And um, yes. all of a sudden, there's this whole part of the current Libertarian Party that's like, yes, yes, that's what we need. We need right. libertarian nationalism. Yeah. And uh, uh, that, that's, that's yeah, that's crazy to me. So is there a problem right now with ethical messaging and ethical uh, targeting and ethical? Is it ethical for the Libertarian Party to tacitly endorse a Trump or an RFK? Yes. Like, uh, who said yes? So John, you, you look right here. Okay, so, Charles, exp yeah. explain your position to me. I mean, I mean, so you know, for all the reasons you just referred to, and Starchild did as well. I mean, if if you're going to leave, I mean, so can you not, you know, define your own course in this world? I mean, if you want to be a Republican or even a light Republican, join the Republican Party. Mm. You know, and, and RFK, you know, he has so many values that don't align with libertarianism. So. To throw him on there is just basically whore him out for ballot access for libertarians. In which case, yeah. you go back to what Starchild alluded to is that so now, you know, what are we basically just running to run candidates as opposed to we've now abandoned all principle so that we can simply achieve ballot access. And by the way, we're going to become, you know, we're going to basically become, you know, a, a, a fractionated party that will fall apart in a few years. So I would agree wholeheartedly. Okay. Oh, you, I'm sorry. When you said yes, I misunderstood. <laughs> you agree that it's unethical. That's correct. I mean, I okay. think it's unethical to participate in, in, in those endeavors. Yeah. Well, you, you, you brought up the, the Sarwark LNC. And, um, you know, I, w I was on the Libertarian National Committee when Nick was chair. And I don't think it, that it was the LNC that was too much left. I think it was Nick himself is a little bit too much in that <laughs> direction. Okay, fair enough. And we in the party have too much of a strong chair system. You know, and I said that then. I say it now. We we put way too much power in the chair, and and so him having that bent, which I, I think became more pronounced over time. I don't think he actually started out that way when I first met him in the party. I didn't get the sense that he was really leaning right. towards left. But he's he's kind of moved that direction. Uh, by the time he left his chair and then you know kind of got his six of henchmen in there, you know they they both. Although you know Joe, I, I wouldn't say is as left leaning as as Nick. I mean he's openly gay sure but he also works for Cato. he's a pretty buttoned down kind of guy um but um you know if you look at the actual policies of the party during that that period i mean aside maybe from the press releases or nick's interviews as chair i don't think it was overbalanced to the left and um i i don't think that historically the party or the movement has had the kind of uh culture in terms of our culture we've tended to be more um not, not even so much a conservative per se, but something that, that, that conservatives would be more comfortable with, which is bourgeois. Um, you know, we, we have our conventions in, in these hotels, which are pretty authoritarian and controlled environments, which has always struck me as, as rather strange and antithetical to what it seems like to me we should be about, which is more the punk spirit of DIY, do it yourself. You know, I suggest we should find a libertarian property owner with space and and you know have our convention more like one of the historical chautauquas from the northeast part of the country you probably, i was gonna say you know, maybe maybe like a lib as, 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 you know, i was gonna say maybe like a libertarian cent. woodstock right like a libertarian woodstock you know just get everybody on something like yatsker's farm and, and just have our convention there but okay so let me let me push back a little bit well, on it doesn't you there. Have to be that crazy i mean that, that you know that sort of you know if, if you just say oh the libertarian woodstock then then you've like lost all the the people that are a <laughs> right. little bit more culturally right. Right but you know right. like pork fest in mm. the free state project new hampshire is a great example of the kind of balance i think we want you know it's it's got something for everybody. There's there's art, there's music and, and politics and speakers and so forth worked in. We could do all our convention business on one weekend, but have like a week long uh, festival. And um, but but aside from just, you know, the 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 cultural milieu being more uh, welcoming, I think, to to people on the left, as opposed to the 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 button down, you know, conservative uh, you know paid atmosphere of the hotels being more comfortable to people right. culturally more on the right 
Um, and, you know, then this extends to things like using Robert's rules of order and people, you know, wearing suits and ties and people <laughs> like me being pressured because we were dressed too outrageously. My state chair, Adrian right. Malagon, has actually tried to <laughs> have me removed <laughs> from our state convention and threatened to do the same for national, uh, you know, because he didn't like, and he couldn't define <laughs> what it was. You know, I said, well, what do you, what do you think I've seen or, you know, inappropriate? Yeah, and he, yeah. he, you know couldn't or well, wouldn't say you know but but it's it's yeah it, well, it just you know, shows that we still have an atmosphere yeah well i was going to say star child i think and and it's look there's a certain perception that's taking that used to take place if i'm being frank right that when you looked at our nominating conventions in the past and you had um mcafee up there you would have um 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 uh, vermin supreme up there uh, and you had like somebody who showed up in speedos, I think, and nothing else. This year we had uh, Toad show up in like a baseball jersey and without shoes and socks. You know, uh, like I understand the the what that is intended to communicate. I I get that, but if you're looking at people, you're trying to persuade. What do you think in, it's? Intended to well, it's it's an anti it's an anti establishment. What, what no, well, I was going to say, I think the perception okay. among the people we're trying to influence and the perception of the people that we're trying to bring into the party is like, hey, are these guys serious? Like, uh, right or wrong, our perceptions of politicians, at least the facade, is that, okay, they do wear a suit and a tie most of the time. They do show up to conduct the debate in a civilized, quote unquote, civilized manner. Um, you know, so if people are showing up in, in, uh, in uh, speedos or wearing a boot on their head or, or showing up with, uh, you know, armed with AR 15s on the podium that this is, I mean, we have to, we have to be honest with ourselves, right? That is disconcerting to a lot of everyday voters, you know, if for no other reason, then that's not what they're accustomed to. Right. So, you know, like Charles, is that self-defeating, even though it fits in with a libertarian ideal? I mean, I mean, I it may get us more to, votes than less. Well, <laughs> maybe in this crazy current political climate. Yeah. But, but I agree. I mean, so so my, my you know my perception of this by and by no means am I you know always right or it, I mean everybody's going to have their opinion. But I see libertarian as just as as, as a means that that of a society where, where one makes their own decisions, and there's not a there's not a this an omnipotent governance governance that basically controls your life. Um, and so in order to affect change and to and to attract to make it a large party, I do think that there has to be some some I can't use the word normalcy because that is not the correct uh, link language, because I personally thought Star Child's hilarious. I mean, you know, I don't find any I find there's no there's nothing that I would find offensive in any way, shape or form. I mean, I grew up in New Orleans. I mean, what walking down the street like that on any given day is, is you would not even bat an eye towards something like that. Right. But, maybe, maybe you're saying we should have stability or decency. And I would agree with that if that's what yeah, you're getting. Yeah. At. I mean, so, so that's the thing. But, but at the same time, if I'm a soccer mom and I'm thinking, you know what, I really hate the current two political party system. And, and what other choices do I have? I want to see someone who is somewhat serious because if you're going to affect my life financially and I'm, you know, and I am, and I am depending on you to make, you know, conscious, you know, good decisions so that you know, you're not getting us off into a foreign war, you know, whether it's you're, or you're overly aggressive or, or, or too docile, uh, you're making, you know, you need to be able to make sound, you know, economic policy. You need to be able to get along with others. You need, you know, to, to, to do all these things. I think you have to show some degree of, of, of professionalism, I guess is the best way to call it. Right. Um, it doesn't mean that you have to wear a suit and tie. And I think walk professionalism is really overrated. Well, well, it is, but at the same time, we're trying to attract people and grow the party, as opposed to turn anyone away. And I, look, I, I think like Berman Supreme, right. he's hilarious. He's hilarious. I mean, absolutely. That, and I get why he does what he does. Yes, I mean, and he will help yeah. us grow the party it, 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 yeah. if we embraced him a little bit more. You know, uh, right, I think the, that he, time, he has more potential. 
party yep. than, than just about well, any other single libertarian I could think of because he appeals to the kind of people that aren't involved in politics right now right. that, that in silly. some ways maybe just you know want to be left alone to do their thing. They're, they're right. culturally libertarian without being politically libertarian. I, I agree wholeheartedly. I know many and, people And that, so, you know, that, and, and look, at, look, at, look at Javier Malay. Look, look how crazy Malay is. The world's first right. elected head of state. You know, he cloned his dogs. You know, he's a tantric sex guy. He's, he's like a, a radical Jewish you know, <laughs> lover of Judaism, even though that's not his But he background. did prove himself he, in politics. Yeah. You know, he's like a, a you know cover cover artist in a Rolling Stones band. You know, using a, a chainsaw at his rallies. Right. You know, it just uh, on right. and on. I mean, this this guy is not normal in any sense of the word. No, right? no, I mean, but, but and yet, time. look, he's the first libertarian head of state in the world. We need to start thinking more outside the box, don't you think? That's that's right. It, but but at the same time, he also has a lot of a lot of you know his his overall bio is not something that is to be scoffed at. I mean, the guy's an you know the guy's an economist. He's an accomplished you know he's an accomplished you know academic. I mean, so you know he he's proven himself in politics before he became you know president. So 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 I would agree with you. I mean, he has a shtick. You know, he he the populace loves him, but but at the same time, he's also proven. I don't himself know how accomplished he was. As, was he? Was he accomplished as an academic, though, or did he just have good self-promotion and, and a good understanding of the ideas to make it, people want to listen to him? I'm not sure that he has like a great, you know, some academic professional thing that would, you know, no, but under he's, normal he's circumstances. Say, oh, this is the he's, guy we want you know, he's a professor at our university. I can't quote his bio, but I have read his bio fairly thoroughly. I mean, and I would call him accomplished. I mean, I, he, he knows far more about economics than I do. I mean, you know, I mean, oh, yeah, well, he accomplished in that sense, but I don't, yeah. I don't know that he has some sort of like professional resume. Before he got elected to Congress, you know, he'd never held an office. Um, you know, I, I think he, he basically studied right. economics. Right. You know, he was right. What's that? Well, well, he also, he also adopted the very Trumpian way of, of politics, right? Which was over the top, very populist. It's just that, fortunately for the Argentinian people, he married that populism with libertarianism and was and and put them on the right path unlike what our populist president has done right which is marry it with some weird keynesian mercantilist i don't even know modern monetary theorist nonsense and i don't know i don't i don't understand what trump is as an economics America guy but whatever first, but really it's trump first <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah so this, right so i so i think you're both right in the sense that Malay did have like the showmanship of a Trump. There's no doubt. And to hear him praise Trump, it's very clear. He modeled his political approach, if nothing else uh, on Trump. It's very obvious, not his policies. His policies are not at all aligned with Trumpism, but uh, yeah. So, I mean, but is that the answer for the for the U.S.? Like, do we all become Trump clones right now? Does it become well, no, like, and, hey, and, you know, Donald Donald Trump didn't event, invent eccentricity or showmanship? No, or, of course not. You know, outside the box politics. I mean, you know, go go back in history a little bit. I mean, you know, uh, Javier Malay maybe is more like somebody like Abby Hoffman or something, but but you know, with good economics, I don't know. I mean, um, there's there's other people that you know we can look to i think as examples i i don't know how strongly he specifically saw trump as a role model you know obviously he has some affinity for him or his style but you know who, who knows i mean he didn't name his dogs after trump he named them after people like <laughs> rothbard right no no i mean i get that but i think i i have seen some interviews where he does credit a, a lot of his style not not again not his substance but his style mm -hmm. uh to trump you Maybe. know the whole Maybe. You know, like the whole uh, was a chainsaw and a fuera and things like that. These are like these are not that it, not that Trump was the first to do that, but Trump might be the most successful uh, by taking that track. Right. Like, I mean, uh, when you talk about people who have never been elected to any office before becoming president uh, without being, say, a military, a general or something like that, how many how often does that happen? Trump, you know, I can't think of the last one before Trump. Right. Um most people I'm like Arnold Schwarzenegger, right? or Jesse Ventura. Right, I'm saying for I mean, for go, uh, for president though. I'm saying for president specifically. Like I'm I'm trying yeah, to think. Not, like not in this country, no, no. Yeah, it's mainly been governors, senators, and the occasional general thrown in there. Right. Uh, Trump is the first one who said, "I you know I have I'm not even elected dog catcher before," and you know here I am sitting in the Oval Office. But anyway, okay. 
So I think we've had a very robust. Well, you know, I'd call him a joker, but that would expose me as a hack, so uh, I won't. Uh, Okay, so I think we've had a very smart. Not everything about him, but uh, I, I I think, um, I mean, he he was, you know, kind of like Trump in that he 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 played the president on TV. I mean, Trump didn't play the president, but I I don't think he would have gotten elected without the whole uh, apprentice thing. People really like the idea of having a no-nonsense guy in the Oval Office who, when somebody didn't do their job, he's going to get, you're fired, you know? That, that I think, uh, really helped Trump. Well, he did build up his brand. There's no, like, listen, even the most ardent anti-Trumper, and I consider myself, to be completely honest, one of those, um, mm-hmm. I to, for me to not acknowledge his marketing genius, his branding, understanding how to connect to people, he has a very much, he's very... He's very empathic with people. I, I don't think you could doubt that. Like it, with the people he wants to connect to, he can be very empathic. He can be very charming. I don't think it's empathy. He can he can be charming. He has a, a good sense of, of kind of your, your empathy but would I be to feel. I don't think he has true empathy. empathy. Yeah. No, he can connect with them though. He knows how to connect with them. Yeah. Um and, and uh, because you're right, empathy technically means he he feels for them. And th- you're right. That I don't know. The country wanted a rebel, and they still do. I mean, yeah. you know, I mean, I don't, you know, I, 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 I that's why I think this this party holds such promise. I mean, I, I, I can feel. I mean, you can feel that there is a palpable feel that you get from from persons from all walks of life across this country that are tired of the status quo politician that says one thing. You know, they have two sides of their face. They, they talk to, you know, they'll talk to <laughs> talk to Star Child on one, and they'll talk to the most conservative individual on the other. I mean, people are tired of that. They like, I think they like Trump because they, you know, they saw a person that spoke what, 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 what he thought as opposed to what it is that they wanted to hear. And they, and they felt as if this individual was genuine as a consequence of that. Um, that's where I think this party holds promise. I mean, I, I really do because, uh, you know, when you, when you listen to persons from this party speak, you know that they're doing it out of beliefs and they, and they believe that there's promise in these beliefs and they're not talking out of just one side of their face to get votes. And it's also the it's also the benefit, one of the few benefits of being a minority political party is that you're not in it for the money. Obviously, right. I mean, you could be in other uh, other rackets if you wanted to make more money, right? Um, so yeah, if I'm you're, still, if, I'm still hoping to get the the Chase Oliver campaign, guys. If you're watching, let's let's have transparency. Let's show that we're not like the other guys. Let's publish every single salary. And I'm still open for a paid yeah. position myself. So I say this as someone with a, <laughs> some stake in the game, perhaps. If, if yeah. Right. And, and if listen, we, public, we should say exactly how much everybody on the Ellen, not the LNC, but the, the libertarian party paid staff makes all the right. contract be public radical transparency. If, if voters can look at us and see that we're practicing what we preach, you know, we're practicing already in our own organizations, what we say we want government to do, then they right. can trust us in a way that they can't trust most politicians because it, that's kind of like having a track record. And, you know, just another professional looking suit and tie politician that's not doing anything differently in terms of the structure of their organization or their campaign or whatever. Why could they trust that? You know, mm. think outside the box. I think, I think the key word is transparency. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. Fully. Tra- yeah. And I know tra- when, I spoke to Star Child on an earlier episode. He that was something he kept repeating. He that he fought for transparency on the local level, and he's still fighting for it on, on the national level. So, uh, a- absolutely something he's always uh, been preaching. Okay, gentlemen, I think we've had a very spirited conversation. I thoroughly enjoyed it, despite the initial technical issues we ran into. I think we overcame those and uh, had ourselves a nice conversation. So, let me start by wrapping up. Um, let me start with Star Child. I'm going to put up your. X handle for folks who want to follow star child, uh, star child. Is there anything else you want to let uh, people know about, uh, where they can find you, how they could help out somehow in the libertarian movement in San Francisco, anything you want to promote or let people know. If you live in the San Francisco area or near here and can get involved locally, we desperately need activists on the ground. Got all kinds of stuff we could be working on if we had more people that wanted to, uh, to get involved and roll up their sleeves. So if you're anywhere in the San Francisco area, hit me up, please. And uh, uh, I can put my email address uh, in here if that's possible. Uh, sfdreamer yeah. at earthlink. You can email me. Yeah. And uh, yeah, uh, oh. just, you know, wherever you are, though, in the world, just, you know, 
we're on the right Good side stuff. of history. You know, be, be optimistic. Stuff. I think I think things okay. are going in the right direction. Thank you, Star Child, and everyone uh, follow Star Child on X and Dr. Charles Belay. Any closing uh, statements or, or no, promotions thank, thank or anything? You, look, look, I I I'm pleasure to see you both yourself and Star Child. Um, you know, I, I hope everyone who's watching this supports our candidate Chase for for president. Um, you know, I hope they support local candidates as well. I think that's just as imperative. Um, seek out who these persons are in your community. They're there. Uh, uh, and try to help them out. They need all the help they can get because they're fighting a true uphill battle. Great words. Thank you for that, Charles. And votechaseoliver.com. Uh, <laughs> com. Yes, support him and Mike, uh, our Libertarian Party uh, ticket for uh, president and vice president. Everyone out there, thank you once again for joining in to Free For All. Uh, check us out, grumblingsmedia.com, where we have a lot of great different types of shows, both entertainment, sports, uh, sports, popular culture, and of course, politics. Uh, and uh, FYI, if you want to check out my podcast, The Big Questions with Big John, where I had the great opportunity to interview both Dr. Charles Belay and Star Child long form. So if you want to get to know either one of these gentlemen or both, uh, a little bit more about them, we had some great uh, long form conversations. Please go check those out. Uh, go to grumblingsmedia.com. And of course, smash the like button, smash the follow button, Grumblings Media, at Grumblings Media, all the streaming platforms, no matter where you are. Until next week, peace. Hey, everybody, this is Big John from Grumblings Media, and I just want to say thank you for watching our content. If you want to support our efforts here at Grumblings Media, just smash the subscribe button right here, totally free, or just go ahead and consume more of our great content. Click either one of these two boxes.